Welcome to the What I Meant to Say podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, founder of Be Better Media and a mom of four, passionate about human connection. Some of these stories contain sensitive content about real life events, and all of the information in this podcast and from anywhere on the Be Better Media website is for informational purposes only. If you find that you need help, which we all do from time to time, please reach out to a licensed professional for help. As a 1984 graduate of the Naval Academy and a sports fanatic, Carl Darden created the Navy Sports Central podcast, where he tells amazing sports stories born out of the core values of the military and illustrates why these athletes perform well, not just in sports, but in the game of life. This is a conversation on sports and American values that you won't want to miss. I am so excited today to be joined by Carl Darden. He is the um, he has his own podcast called Navy Sports Central, and he caught my eye on Podmatch, which is kind of a cool service out there that's helping podcasters and guests find each other. And um, I was drawn to your story, Carl, because of your your tied both to the the veteran community and the sports community, which are two really big interests in my life and in the development of this podcast and other things we're working on at Be Better Media. So I thank you so much for saying yes and joining me today. Well, thanks for asking. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So um, let's jump right in. And I would love to get a sense for what your journey to the Naval Academy was like and how you ended up there. And then, you know, what what piqued your interest in Navy sports? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um When I think back, and I tell the story a lot because for a, a long time, up until actually just this past summer, I've been involved with uh, young men and women who want to go to the academy. I'm part of the admissions process by doing interviews and such. So I asked that same question of them, you know, how did you first become interested in the academy? And for me, it goes back to a day that I was uh, walking my dog in our neighborhood. And one of our one of our neighbors who actually was an old family friend, we were actually stationed together. My dad was in the Air Force. And uh, when I was born in Las Vegas, the, our two families were stationed together. And he worked in the same capacity with um, the Naval Academy Missions Office as I did up until recently. He is what they called a liaison officer. And he did the same thing. So one day I'm walking my dog and I'm walking past the house and he runs outside with this catalog and he says, hey, Carl, check out this catalog. I think you might be interested in it, you know? So I said, okay. So I I took it home. And um, so this is between my ninth and 10th grade years in high school. And so I go home and I start kind of flipping through it. And I will tell you that whoever did the marketing for the Naval Academy back then did an excellent job because you don't usually read catalogs cover to cover, but I did. (laughs) I I just started from the very beginning and right on through I mean, it, it, it outlined every single major. Once it told you about the academy, it outlined every single major in the classes you had to take to to meet those requirements and all that kind of stuff. It talked about, you know, follow-on opportunities after graduation, talked about the sports that they played there, all that stuff. And by the time I was done, I just told my dad and my mom, I said, that's where I'm going. I mean, I will apply to other places just for looks, but that's where I'm going. And I did everything I could my remaining three years in high school to be as competitive as I could for an appointment. And luckily it all worked out. And, and that's how I wound up at Annapolis. Wow. Wow. What was your parents' reaction when you came to them? So, so convinced. Well, my, uh, my dad, I think, you know, being a, an air force guy himself, you know, he felt pretty good about it. I think he, he really liked the idea of, of having a son, you know, going to the military as well. Uh, my mom was supportive, but as moms are, when it comes to their sons potentially being put in harm's way, there's that that instinct that kind of kicks in. But she was very proud as well. And I think that uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have them both still around right now. And uh, it's, it's just been great, you know, that without their support, I never would have been able would have never been able to make it through because it was a challenge. It was not a cakewalk by any means. Yeah. And we'll definitely get into some of that because that's what I am. I'm definitely drawn to, you know, the, the the personality and the, you know, the character strengths that, that create a good candidate for mm-hmm. the military academies. And maybe we could, let's start with some of that. Like what mm-hmm. do you think some of those things are and that, that you possess and that you see in the other candidates that, that you talk to? Well, I think that, First of all, to, to go there, you have to have some baseline level of patriotism, right? I mean, you just can't go 
to just say, okay, this is just going to be another job for me. Uh, some people like myself, you know, you don't make the Navy a career, but you have to have some baseline level of patriotism that's going to be enough to sustain you, especially when things get kind of tough. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you want to be, uh, you know, a pretty well-rounded individual. I mean, obviously you want to get the, the Naval Academy competes for top candidates, just like any other school, but they do it not only on the academic level, but on the you know athletic level and such. So uh, if you do have that sense of, you know, having played a lot of sports and so forth in high school, then that does help because you already know what it's like to work within a team, how to be selfless, that sort of thing. So I look for that a lot in the candidates that I was interviewing as well. Yeah, I definitely think um, as I get through these stories um, and I'm always looking at like, you know, the health and wellness aspects of how we become better people and the drive that I see in athletes is I, I've seen in some of the veteran stories we've worked with that that drive comes across in the veteran population. I've seen it as well in like the first responders population. There seems there's just a lot of crossover. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it doesn't surprise me at all to hear what you're saying. And I think, you know, it's interesting in this day and age in America and some of the things that we're going up against. One of the things I really worry about with the next generation and maybe worry is not the same, but I right word, but I like, I want the message that we're sending to the next generation to perhaps be stronger than, you know, or, or to, to encourage their strength in mm -hmm. ways that I don't necessarily on a lot of fronts right now, I don't see that being encouraged. And, mm -hmm. and there's, um, I wonder if you have a sense for, you know, maybe the, the mission statements of the military academies and, and the way that they work with their, um, the, the students, uh, cadets coming through that might be different than what we're getting in a regular high schools and then going to American universities out there? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think that, uh, at least for me, um, I do try to have some level of of influence. Like, you know, obviously you can't change the world, but you can change your little corner of it, right? So right. what I try to do, and, and I'm, I'm, everybody knows me, I'm very transparent when it comes to the academy. I promote it at every possible opportunity. <laughs> so, so even these days, like one of the things I do, I, I'm kind of like semi-retired now, but one of the things I do, I spend a lot of time at the the school where my kids went to junior high as a substitute teacher, I, you know, mostly math and science, but I can cover just about every subject, right? So one of the things that I started was um, just this past year, in fact, I have a, a, a meeting uh, tomorrow, I started up a math club. So we have about like, you know, 14 or 15 of the sharpest kids in the school. And, uh, you know, I am, as I'm going through a little math routine and your math club routine and such, I'm kind of eyeballing them to see what kind of potential they might have to, to go to the academy because uh, you want to be able to project the right, um, yeah, I don't know if the image is the right word, but basically convey the a message that might be something that lands on them in a positive way because i i mean the the kids that i'm working with right now every last one of them have the potential to mm -hmm. get into the naval academy it's just a question of not whether or not they want to do it right? right and so many times you want to just be able to represent yourself in such a way that they see you as somebody that they want to emulate and if that's if that's what happens then that's great you know they'll go ahead and follow along Anytime anybody has questions, I always am ready to answer them. I talk to other adults, you know, other teachers and so forth about, you know, you know, students to look out for, that sort of thing. But you make a good point. I I can't really speak for what's going on outside of my little sphere. But uh, like I said, every chance I get an opportunity to talk about the the Naval Academy and and by extension, you know, the other service academies in general. Obviously, I'm biased towards Navy, but uh I'm going to want to get that message out because we want top-notch people just like anybody else, any other organization. And it's not going to thrive unless we have those people. Yeah. And I think, I think mentorship, I love what you're talking about. Mentorship to me is, is so important. It's like co good coaches, good teachers, good mentors outside of parenting. It's so important for these kids to be getting a message from someone other than their parents and hopefully right. they're getting it from their parents. But often it's like the other messenger that comes in and says, Hey, I believe in you. This is what I see in you. 
and mm-hmm. did you know where you could take this? Because, you know, kids don't always know. And until it's recognized, you know, that was one of the things I worried about through COVID was like getting really good feedback. So it's cool to hear that that's a role you've played. And, you know, and I think it matters, especially at the junior high level. It's like <laughs> such, it's like such a time to be survived, you know, and yeah. get stronger in those times. But man, that is, a, that's an instrumental age to be getting in and giving them a really solid message about, you know, understanding who they are and playing from their strengths and that kind of thing. So that's, for sure. for that. that's really cool. So how old, how old are your kids? Mine are grown now. They're uh, okay. well, somewhat grown. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's a junior at university of Arizona. Okay. And my son is a sophomore. He's going to Glendale Community College here in town. And then he's going to, he's in his second year, but he's going to transfer to Arizona State next year. So very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a journey. I have four and I, I, parenting is one of, it's just, it's a great gift and it's a huge, it can be a challenge <laughs> right. and a, it's, I, it, but I, I, I love it. So I always love, you know, going back and forth with other parents because I always say it's an art, not a science. And very true. We can yeah. we can uh, learn from each other from that. So, um, so I'm curious, like how you know when you go, we start getting into sports, and you said you played multiple sports through high school, and mm-hmm. kind of looking towards the Naval Academy. What sports did you play? Well, I played uh, my the sport that I focused on in high school was baseball, uh, but then I realized that right about my sophomore year, when I couldn't hit a breaking ball with consistency that I was going to retire after, (laughs) after I graduated. So, but when I got to the Academy, the cool thing there was you, you basically had to play some sort of sport if you weren't involved in like an activity, like, you know, um, music or theater or something like that. So whether it was on the intramural level or the varsity level, that's what you did. So I played all kinds of sports there and it was a lot of fun. And um, so you're talking about basically your, your touch football, your, uh, baseball and basketball were the three that I focused on the most, but they had, they had rugby. In fact, rugby was just elevated to a varsity sport just this past spring. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But they had, um, and they just have all these other ones that, uh, fencing is another one that people don't know too much about, um, squash, water polo is a varsity sport. So they have a bunch that you can play right now. I think the Naval Academy has a total of 35 varsity sports for men and women. And that ranks third behind um, Ohio state and Stanford, I believe. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. My, my son goes to Stanford. Um, oh, wow. Plays, plays um, men's volleyball. And when Stanford almost, they, his freshman year, they almost cut 11 varsity sports. And so they would have fallen below that, but we got those sports reinstated. And oh, part great. of, Part of that journey, I mean, it was it was a group of it was the athletes, the alumni, and the parents that you know led the charge to get the eleven sports put back. Because what I learned and I knew from that was, you know, when kids grow up playing a sport, they really their leadership skills are really developed through that sport. And if you take an eighteen year old kid and cut that place that they have learned where to lead or how to lead. And then just put them on a, you know, lead them into a university and then cut the sport that kind of got them there. You really leave them exposed. Yeah. To, you know, it's mm-hmm. not like all of a sudden you can go, you know, join the, you know, join theater or join the swim team if you've been a basketball player, or volleyball player. And so it really made me think a lot about the leadership potential, no, no matter what medals or championships or conferences you win it's those leadership skills that we learn being part of a team that are so instrumental in, in life. Right. Right. So Mm -hmm. um, that gave me a really good perspective on some time to really think about what it is that I value so much in sports. And much like you, I, I was cut um, because of an injury. I was a walk on, on the volleyball team in college. I came from the central Valley that the coaching wasn't quite the same. Everybody from Southern California was ahead of me. And then I injured my ankle and I was cut. And it led me to the intramural sports. Uh Uh, And as much as I look back and think, oh, wow, I really missed, like I was bummed when I got cut. It really opened up a world of fitness and friendship and like great times that I look back on and go, you know, it, it, it really wasn't. And now I look at some of the struggles that college athletes have in the way that, you know, in a lot of cases, they can be treated like commodities. Oh yeah. I think they really run the heck out of these kids. They don't always pay attention to what's best because every athlete is so different. Yeah. And 
I think you and I might have the perspective and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like there is a lot to gain just from sports participation on any level. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't have to be a division one or even a division two experience, you know? Well, that's true. And I will tell you that, uh, I mean, like I said, I had so much fun playing at that level. And then what, what it also allows you to do is like, say, you know, after graduation, you know, you go to your different commands and so forth. Well, the military has a really good intramural structure at every command that you go to, right? So you can go ahead and participate in those sports. I mean, I played I played volleyball at my very first command, and I am telling you, we we played a high level. I mean, it's not going to be Division One volleyball, but it is an extremely high level because you had players that did play D one, and yeah. you know they were their their game was not quite as sharp as when they were in college because they were just doing it every day, yeah. but it was still exciting competitive volleyball and one of my one of my fondest moments is when we actually under winning our our base championship against a team that had way more talent than we did but we just played better together you know and it oh, was just kind of a neat chills. thing I, and yeah. I, I truly believe I think that I've had the most experience with volleyball so but I, that truly is it could be the same in basketball that that team experience it really mm -hmm. does make a difference like it is not always yep. the all-star that wins. And so I, that that's one of my favorite, favorite experiences in sports is when there's that real sense of community and team that plays together and it elevates, yeah. everyone, you know, and yeah. again, there's so many lessons we learn in life uh, or in sports that take us out into life and serve us well. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really curious um, as to the, the Naval Academy experience and like what it is, that may be different in that environment to be an athlete, either on the intramural or the varsity level. Yeah. If you're a cadet and then, you know, usually a regular student athlete doesn't have that. So what do you think are some of the differences and things that they have to handle at the, at the Academy as athletes? Yeah, that's a good question. And I will tell you that it really comes down to three, right? The first thing is straight up academics. Okay. I mean, the, the average D one athlete, in in a regular civilian school college university you know credit hours maybe you know certainly 12 maybe 15 i don't know but at the naval academy you're talking 18 to 20 every single semester and and that is not a joke um then the next thing is everybody no matter what major you are has to take a level of engineering course so they have to take some engineering track okay and they also have to take you know leadership and stuff like that but whether you're an English major or an electrical engineer, you take some level of engineering. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is because ultimately you're going to be become a professional label officer and you got to have that background. Okay. And then the last thing is uh, just all the other competing demands. I mean, you, uh, if you're at a regular college university, you know, you go to class you know, if you feel like it, I guess. <laughs> and then, and then you come home and you're basic and then you do your sport. Right. But uh, when you're talking, when you're going to the Naval Academy or any of the service academies, first of all, going to class, that's that's a given. You, you don't go to class, you get written up, okay, unless you're sick. Um, and then you got to have a slip to prove that. And then the other thing is you have after school, of course, I mentioned the sports that you have to play or some other activity. But And, and probably things have changed a little bit now, but uh, there was times when, well, they still have professional lectures at night every so often, you know, not maybe like once a quarter or something like that. But we used to have a lot of uh, exams at night uh, for some of the professional courses back in, the, back in the day. I'm not sure if they do now, but there was all kinds of stuff that just ate into your time after school, uh, dress parades, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so it was managing those competing demands that was really important. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have a really good handle on that until I was about, you know, halfway through my second year before those that started to come together. And uh, so that those are probably the three biggest things that make it different going to the academy versus going to a regular college or university if you're an athlete. Yeah, that's I mean, that's a lot. And that is so different than what kids are experiencing out there these days, especially coming through COVID and so many things being you know, changing and maybe not knowing what the standard is or test scores are in or test scores are out. And there's just so many things in society that have moved over the last couple of years, even. Right. And I wonder, um, you know, one, I'm wondering, like, what was it? What support was offered? Like, how did you get through that first year and a half when you were saying, like, I didn't really have it down? Like, 
how did you how how back then did you get through it and then do you have any um idea of like what they're doing now because i i can imagine the caliber of 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 cadet is still high but yeah you know they're coming through a really wild world yeah yeah and i think so, so to answer your question the thing i could have done a better job of doing is reaching out to my classmates earlier okay because obviously there were a lot that were way smarter than me and i you know i came from a pretty good public school system and i finished at the top of my class or at least in the top two percent or whatever so i just kind of had this mindset it wasn't really like you know uh, like a macho mindset or anything like that but i just felt like okay you know i've had to deal with tough classes before i can i can do this you know but i was realizing after a year year and a half that okay maybe i can take the load off myself a little bit because I always had classmates that were willing to help. And if classmates came to me in a subject that I was strong in, I always helped them. So I don't know why I was so hard headed the, the first couple of years not to to seek help from them. But uh, that's probably the best way, you know, just understanding that there's, you know, your classmates are always ready to help you. And then the the support structure that's there now is very similar because there are all kinds of organizations you can join to uh, enhance that whole college experience, you know, whether they're affinity groups or uh, just different organizations. I always talked about the you know, music and the arts and stuff like that. They have those available to you. Uh, I mean, the Naval Academy has got one of the best glee clubs and choirs in the country, you know, so yes. um, those, those sorts of things are available and that gives people, you know, a sense of being grounded and, and that helps because if you always have some sort of a, um, you know, a life preserver to latch on to, that's going to be enough to get you through. It doesn't matter what it is, but uh, like I said, for me, it just took a while to find it. And, and, and that was just knowing that, okay, my classmates are there to help me and I can go to them whenever I need it. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this chat as much as I am. For more great content, courses, and lifestyle, go to BeBetterMedia.tv. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that's such great advice, again, coming from a mentor role of of learning how to ask for help. And I think for those of us that have been, you know, strong and athletes and veterans and, and, and cadets, we're all taught to to push and we know how strong mm -hmm. we are. But that next layer of maturity and learning that ability to ask for help is such a big one. And for sure. something that like I really want to accomplish through my podcast is like, if there's lessons that I've learned, I really, I love these conversations that try to impart those lessons to people. And I love it if they could learn them younger than I did. So I, I hear <laughs> right. you, I hear you on the asking for help thing. And it is, it is huge. It's, it's absolutely, it's huge. So yeah, yeah that's a big one. And yeah. um, I guess um, like before we get into the sports, cause I, I want to get some sports stories here, but right. um, if you were talking to, a potential cadet um, today and you know they hear and I guess m maybe by the time they get to you they are they really want to be there but mm -hmm. how about a kid that hears like they hear the hard things that you're saying they hear how difficult this journey is to become you know to get into the Naval Academy and have that experience um, but what are some of like the what are the positive things that you would say that to bring them in like yes it's hard but mm -hmm. This is what I garnered from this experience. Right. Um, I think that uh, the one thing that always stuck in my mind is this quote. I don't even know who came up with it, but it says, the Naval Academy is a hard place to be, but a great place to be from. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I speak to that a lot. I said, look, there's going to be challenges in life. And uh, if you want to see, you know, if you are, the type of person who is who is 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 a good fit for the academy think about what you've been doing over the last you know several years and so forth and if if you, you have that kind of drive and and you can see it like i mean when i was when i talked to these kids you know both the young men and women i can tell a set of friends that um you will have for the rest of your life okay i mean i have classmates that i've graduated with i can think back to just the last reunion I went to is my 35th year reunion. I saw people that I hadn't seen in 20, 25 years. We'd pick up our conversation just like that, you know, and like, like we'd never skipped a beat. And we think about 
the advantages professionally, right? You go in, you do your time in the Navy or the Marine Corps, you go out into the professional world if you choose to do that. Mm -hmm. You run into the classmates and alumni and so forth, and they can they're right there to help you. So it's a, it's a, almost like a built-in network that you have going for you as well. And I know that you have that at some other colleges and universities, but the the Naval Academy and and also West Point and Air Force Academy a little bit different, I would I would venture to say, because uh, whether you're a midshipman at the academy or, or a cadet at uh, Army or Air Force, it's it's a a brother and sisterhood that you just can't uh, you can't beat it. And and it's something that I always will take away. Yeah, that's that's really really cool. Um, so. Tell me a little bit about um, how you got into podcasting and Navy Sports Central. Oh, okay. So, yeah, kind of a, an interesting story. Um, I'm in our class uh, Facebook group. I joined it, I guess it was like about 12, 13 years ago or so. And I wasn't really terribly active on it. But during like football season, every so often I would, um, you know, during saying, hey, um, Navy won today. They played pretty well. And, you know, that was basically it. Three, four sentences at the most. And then as, as time went on, eventually they started morphing into this total game analysis slash breakdown, talking about, okay, they won, and here's how they won, and here's just why they won, you know? <laughs> so started getting into all that. And then my uh, my old college roommate from my sophomore year says, hey, have you ever thought about starting a blog? Because you you write in such a way that even people who don't, follow football can understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know? So I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. And I don't know that I really have the time because at the time I was still working, you know, in the corporate world, I was working for a pharma company um, as a sales manager and I was traveling all the time and that sort of thing. So I just kind of let it slide. But, but then, you know, I, I kept on doing it. And when I went back for my, my last reunion, I was talking to a, a classmate. She was, uh, she lived in North Carolina and she says, you know, I I gave some of your um, your blog posts to uh, somebody I work with because she worked in public relations, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, you really should consider starting a blog because you have a knack for for writing, and I don't think you should just let it go. And I said, no, you you might be onto something. I'll I'll kind of check it out when I when I get home. And she says, she says, I'm not just blowing smoke up your butt, you know. She goes, yeah. I I. I do this for a living. So I, I kind of, you know, know what, what I'm talking about. And I said, all right. So I went back and I did the research and decided to go ahead and, and start the uh, blog in early 2020, which was kind of interesting because I was all excited to start talking about all the Navy sports. And I'm thinking, okay, the content is just going to be creating itself because there's always new information, new news and everything like that. And then bam, <laughs> college sports are done you yeah. know, for, the whole, for the whole spring. I'm thinking, okay, timing could have probably been a little bit yeah. better. On that <laughs> totally. one, you know? so, but what I did was I, I kind of uh, kept it together by doing a lot of these, what we call look back pieces, right? Where, I would go back and I said, okay, let's take a look back and talk about when the Navy women's lacrosse team made it all the way to the final four, or let's talk about the first time, you know, Navy knocked off air force in like, you know, 15 years or what, well, not 15 years, but the, that what started basically a seven game winning streak and started to kind of flip the script on the Navy air force rivalry, you know, that sort of thing. So I did a lot of that until things started kind of getting back on track. And then that's, uh, geni that's genius, honestly, because I remember that's uh, that's when I was watching every 30 for 30 I could get my hands on <laughs> because and then yeah. yeah, and then the Jordan series came out. And I was oh, like, sure, yeah, God for sports stories. Because when I don't really w watch much TV except for sports, and when we didn't have them, that's you know, when I realized, like, man, as much as I love sports, I love the story behind the game way more than even the game, so. It's yeah, that, was, for sure. that was a brilliant, brilliant idea in a time of struggle because it makes perfect sense to me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So from, from covering yeah. the old stuff. So um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So then, you know, things kind of started to pick up and then I forget, I forget how I got going with the, uh, the podcast. How I started, Oh, I know. I just started kind of thinking about it as just another natural extension of the whole uh, content piece, right? So I looked into that and there was one other podcast that covered Navy sports that I knew about, 
that actually launched about the same time I launched the podcast. And they were pretty well connected. I mean, they, they, the guy who started it was, was you know, he used to work uh, in uh, public relations at the academy, even though he wasn't an academy grad. The guy who worked with him was an 82 graduate who was pretty dialed into the uh, sports information director's office and stuff like that. So they could basically book any guests they wanted to, you know. So I figured, okay, I'm going to try and carve out a different niche where I still want to talk about Navy sports, but I'm I'm going to talk about as many as I can and just especially featuring the ones that kind of fly underneath the radar a little bit. So I was able to get guests like, um, in fact, I'm interviewing another one tomorrow for the second time, uh, the coach of the, uh, of the Navy rowing team. Okay. Uh, rowing is probably one of the elite sports at the Academy and it's, it's got a rich history, uh, back in, in 1952, the, the team from the Naval Academy won the Olympic gold medal in the Helsinki Olympics, uh, back then. So, uh, it's got a rich history. Um, I was able to do, I went out to Annapolis last year just for a visit to, 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 gets ostensibly to go watch a football game and connect with some classmates. But while I was out there, I was also, I had a chance to chat with the rowing coach again, and he took me out while they were practicing. And I took a bunch of pictures for a piece that I did. Uh, and I put in a blog um, that fall. So last fall. So uh, the, the podcast, I decided to just kind of go with that niche where, yeah, we'll talk about, we'll talk about Navy sports, but maybe what I'll do for guests is, pull in a lot of these coaches that you don't hear about that often. And then when I want to talk about uh, sports, like, you know, even football and basketball and stuff, get former athletes, especially if they were in my class, you know, I could reach out to them and say, Hey, you want to be, you want to team up on this one and talk about the basketball team. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And to this day, my most popular episode is when I was talking with one of my, um, my Naval Academy sisters who uh, played, she was a cat. I coached just basically at the youth level, but it was so much fun talking with her. And that's still my most popular episode after doing, I think a total of 38 or 39 so far. And um, so it's the sports that people don't hear about as often that tend to be the most popular with my listeners, because it's almost like they're starving for the information, right? I mean, they just don't hear it enough. So anytime they do, they're going to go with it, you know? Yeah, no, that that that's fascinating and makes a lot of sense because obviously there's so much out there on football and basketball, right? Like we all, yeah. well, we hear about all those, but um, that's also one of the things I learned about um, in saving the Stanford sports was the the because a lot of the sports that were cut were you know the the off the beaten path, you know, and what I learned about field hockey and the athletes that play it and the people that were rallying to save that team, yeah, there were just so many. I mean, athletes are athletes and oftentimes the ones who are playing for less accolades, like I'm fascinated by that. It's not, yeah. that, it's not that the big accolades don't love their sports. Right. But you know, when you don't get TV time or you're, and you're really just out there early in the morning and nobody's really paying attention. I mean, to me, that's like, it's, it shows such determination and love for your sport because you really are intrinsically motivated. It's not going to be on sports center, you know, yeah. on Saturday night. Yeah. Hey. And that's exactly why I do this. I, yeah. I, it's so much fun to, 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 cause I mean, like you said, athletes are athletes. They work just as hard as the others, right. And their in their respective disciplines to be as good as they can be. And they are elite at that level. It's just that nobody knows about it. We have athletes at the Academy who are, you know, world champions right now. I can, I can name you, you know, one in particular, Alexandra Valencia Martinson. Okay. She is a, she just graduated, okay. um, came from, uh, I believe she's from Oregon, hmm. never picked up an oar in her life before getting to the academy and just, you know, picked it up. She just had a knack for it. Uh, she was part of a, a mixed crew that won the uh, the King's Cup at the Henley Royal Regatta in January, I'm sorry, in July of 2019. Uh, that was against military crews all over the country. You know, they came to Henley, which is in England, and um, and rode in that event, and they won that. Then she competed in the world championships, the under 23 world championships in 2021 before her senior year. And she won the gold medal in the uh, fours with the coxswain, I think, and the silver in the eights. So, I mean, nobody knows about her, but yeah. she is a world champion, you know, and those are the ones I want to make sure people know about. 
I oh that that is so cool and I think those stories are so important because um for one of the reasons I think is just even for for athletes athletic kids and parents alike to hear like later exposure to life in sport mm -hmm. and like being able to or knowing that you can always pick up something if you show some interest and you want to work the the cream rises to the top so for mm -hmm. the sports world that the youth sports world that's out there right now that really does concern me on a lot of levels as far as like you know kids getting lessened to death and mm -hmm like having to show up at young ages and specialize in sports and knowing that like the ones that really truly have an aptitude that and of course a work ethic too but you could to have a world champion that that starts at that age like it, those stories really fascinate me because yeah. like you know there's a lot out there right now that we're we're burning kids out mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not their motivation. It's the generation before them that are, you know, and it's like letting kids figure out, guiding them rather than kind of pushing them. Yeah. And I think, I think that's such a good point. And you, you, and obviously you being a parent know this as well. I mean, my daughter, uh, we wanted to expose her to sports, at least to kind of get her thinking about it. And she played a little bit of volleyball when she was younger and and that sort of thing. But the sports never took with her. She was more of a, um, a, a music person, which was totally fine. Yeah. And uh, so she moved in that direction. And then, you know, my son, he showed an aptitude for, for different sports early. We, we kind of started him in basketball uh, at a pretty young age just to kind of get him socially uh, yeah. adapted to, to people because, you know, he's a very shy kid when he was younger. And he he developed into a pretty good player. And but I always, it was always kind of one of these things where I would always tell him, I said, listen, and this is even from the time he was eight and nine years old. I said, look, uh, are there any other sports you'd, you'd like to play or would want to, you know, consider playing? And he says, he says, not really. He goes, I, I kind of like basketball. And I said, okay, that's cool. I said, now, I said, the other thing is, and I'm just going to tell you straight up. I said, you are, I mean, I played a lot of basketball when I was growing up, but not organized basketball. I said, you are way better than I was when you were my age okay but that doesn't mean that you have to you know just totally focus on this you can take this as far as you want to go and i can give you a pretty good plan to to get where you want to go but it's all going to be up to you you got to put in the work and if you do then i'll be right there with you i will support anytime you know if i'm at home and this is one of the reasons why i kind of you know shifted out of the corporate world and did more stuff at home um if you want to say, hey, dad, let's go shoot baskets. I will drop what I'm doing <laughs> and we will go shoot, you know? Yeah. So, but, and and he he ended up doing well. I mean, his high school career, you know, the, the program itself at the high school was in, constantly in a state of flux. And he was actually the only senior on his team his final year. Mm -hmm. um, ended up having a good season. Was uh, selected a uh, most valuable player and that sort of thing. But, you know, afterwards, he was finished. Uh, we were shooting around one day at the Air Force Base, and I said, hey, uh, I see, you know, Glendale's got a pretty good team. And you feel like walking on there? And he says, he goes, no, Dad, I think uh, I've had a lot of fun, but I think I'm just going to I'm gonna hang it up and just play. I said, okay. So that's cool. I said, the one advice I will give you is stay connected to the game, even if you're just playing with your buddies, you know, at the park or whatever, because uh, when you get older, you get out of college and so forth, maybe you find a job with a company, uh, basketball, maybe not as much as golf, but basketball is one of those sports where you can make connections. And, you know, if you have to be playing a pickup game at a corporate meeting or something like that, you never know who you run into and end up, you know, connecting with them. Maybe they become your mentor or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So there's always some value in it, whether or not you decided to take it to the next level in college. And so, yeah, I mean, he, his, the plan I had for him worked out great. And, you know, he's all the better person for it. And he didn't go through a lot of that other burnout things that that other kids did because I just let him go at his own pace yeah I mean that's definitely something I realize as I've gone through life and and I think you and I talked and you said I was just good enough at a lot of sports and I kind of feel the same way about myself like people <laughs> right, right. dang I'm like okay I'm athletic but I kind of had a shy gene that would didn't you know just put me right in this I never wanted to be right in the center I didn't play basketball long enough because it was so aggressive I gravitated toward volleyball mm -hmm. and swimming but I kind of learned my personality through sports. And then I also saw the places I needed to sharpen. Right. Right. But that concept of not being like 
I look back and go, oh, did I miss out because I could have been better? Mm -hmm. Or I'm starting to think like, wow, I learned a lot and I didn't experience that burnout. And I'm 47 and I still love to play volleyball and I still love to swim. Sure. I, I never hit that point. So, you know, everything is, as we know, is like in, in the way you frame it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I do see that problem out there now of, of, you know, real, real extreme burnout when yeah. you finish. And um, yeah, it's something I I'm fascinated by and hoping that there's enough help and attention to that, to that issue that, that athletes understand that there's so much more than their athletic story that there's right. so underneath that. And I think you telling the stories behind the sports and knowing that like we learn those lessons at any level of sports, if you learn how to be a good teammate, if you learn how to be coached and you learn how to show up on time and remember the right Jersey and all of those things, like that happens on every level, if you allow it. Yep. To me, that's some of the most important things we learn through. Yeah. Sport. So for sure. Uh, now, um, are there any stories coming up on the Navy, on the, on the, on the Navy scene that you think people should be looking out for? Is there anything you have coming up on your show? I mean, you, you mentioned that the rower, but anybody else that we should be watching out for? Yeah. Let me think about this. Uh, Cause I, I try to get, um, you know, I, I'm really sensitive to the mid times because uh, of everything they have going on. And I've interviewed a couple of midshipmen for both the podcast and the blog and things have gone really well. But one thing I found that's really interesting is I, I'm going to try to, again, kind of connect with some of these athletes uh, that are in sports that that we don't know too much about. And I, I will be quite honest with you. I am really, I had really become a huge rowing fan since I started the blog. Uh, because I would, I would say that as a, as a, um, as a sport, that's probably the one that appeals to me as I get older, it appeals to me the most because it's something you can continue to do. Mm -hmm. And just, there's something about doing the same thing over and over and over again, but then having to do it with six, you know, for set with seven or well, three at a minimum, and then seven other people to the point where you can propel a, a, a shell through the water, you know, faster than anybody else. I mean, that to me is really something. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk with, when I, when I interview the rowing coach tomorrow, I'm going to specifically ask him, Hey, look, I don't, I don't normally, you know, like to interview the mids because I know it's just their time is precious and I don't want to encro- encroach upon it. But, you know, do you think there'd be anybody that would be willing to kind of talk with me about their experience in terms of, you know, how they got interested, you know, all that kind of stuff, because I will tell you that if there is ever an opportunity for me to interview that young lady that I just mentioned to you before, I will do it <laughs> because her, her story is just amazing to me. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking at doing it in, in, in future shows. Is, and you know, the other thing that's kind of fun too, is um, to be able to pull in uh, the parents of some of these athletes, right? So my, I have a, a, a Facebook group, uh, the Navy Sports Nation Facebook group. It's a, it's a private group. But one thing I noticed, and I was going through, I think we have like 800 or so people in there. But as I was going through the list, I've noticed that there are a lot of parents of current athletes there, including the one who, the mom of the current Navy quarterback. So oh. two months ago, yeah. So it was actually as long as, even before that, it was back uh, last year. Uh, she had, um, we had connected on Twitter and stuff. And I, you know, kind of mentioned I was going out through the Academy last October for, to go watch the Navy SMU game. And she kind of chimed in there, you know, maybe we'll see you there, you know, like that. So uh, that morning I was out with the rowing team and then I was walking over to the stadium um, to connect with some of my classmates at the tailgater. And as soon as I walk into the whole stadium grounds, the first person I see, somebody yells out, Hey, Carl. And I turn around and it's Gina Lavatai, who is Ty Lavatai's mom. <laughs> she goes, oh, Gina. And I go, oh my God, you know, <laughs> who would have thought we'd run into each other? So anyway, long story short, um, we kind of went back and forth. This is after uh, Navy beat Army. It was a pretty big upset at the time. And I just asked her, hey, would you be willing to come on the show one of these days and just kind of talk about what you know Ty was like as a kid? And she says, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it. Uh, anyway, we did have a chance to do that. Um, a couple months back and I put the episode on in August and it was a real hit. And then I talked to another guy whose son was a starting offensive lineman for the sprint football team. Now sprint football, again, division one sport, but you're talking about 
you, you have to make weight. You have to, you can't weigh more than 178 pounds to play. Right mm. now it's a, it's a very regional thing. Um, it, they, they have teams all up and down the East coast and then out probably as far as, you know, maybe, maybe we we'll have to look at the list, but anyway, um, but Army has a team, so they square out. In fact, Navy beat Army in sprint football just this past Friday, so that was cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, I interviewed uh, this gentleman, and he coached his son, who was an offensive lineman growing up, right? So mm -hmm. he was able to give the parent perspective and the coach perspective. And again, another very popular episode in a sport that, yeah, it was football, but it was, you know, it was sprint football, which not a lot of people really know about. And so those are the sorts of things that I want to do more of. Um, so I'm well, looking forward to seeing the opportunity to do that. Yeah, it's really cool how I see two different things in there. It's really cool how you're finding new spaces that people don't know about, like sprint football. I've never heard of that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so being out there in that kind of novel world, and then also like you're hitting on such a amazing what could be a pain point, but also like a pain, a, as always, a place for growth is that that triangle between parents, coaches, and athletes. Right, right. Something mm -hmm. that I am so fascinated by, and I a lot of what I've done through my blog and then starting this podcast has been really focused on like getting really curious about that relationship and how we can make it better and how we can help athletes more and how is the older generation we can really help the younger generation and so it's cool to see you doing that because yeah, there yeah. is I mean the way the universe works like for us to to kind of find this conversation it's because we're both you know we're pushing on a lot of the same the same buttons and right. trying to figure out the why behind it so yeah really I enjoy that so I will, I'll definitely be a new fan to New <laughs> Central. And yeah, I appreciate that. that. Yeah. But um, one of the questions I always like to ask um, everybody that comes on my podcast is, you know, what is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Well, um, I think I touched on it uh, a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail. Um, when it comes to and when I, when I think of my younger self, I'm thinking going back to high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, when I made the decision to go to the Academy, the blinders went on and that was my focus. Right. And you know, everything worked out. Same thing when I was at the Academy and the goal was basically, okay, let's, you know, the goal is to graduate, you know, you can do this on your own, blah, blah, blah. Of course I realized, okay, you can't do it on your own. <laughs> you need a lot of help, but nevertheless, but to answer your question, I would I would say the best advice I could have given myself or that I could give myself as a younger version is is to take off the blinders and see what's going on around you a little bit more. Because I, you know, I had a decent time in high school, but I probably could have had even more fun if I knew more of my classmates, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and at the academy, I think that there is this sense of, you know, always wanting to get through the next test or, you know, do this or do that, that as as fun a time as I had, you know, my senior year, I'm thinking, okay, if I could have pulled that down into my sophomore year a little bit more, then it might have been even more enjoyable for me, right? And and I think that that's one reason I appreciate my classmates so much now is because there's a lot of them, you know, if they were if they didn't live on my floor or they weren't in my major, there's not much of a chance that I would have known them, and just being able to go back to these reunions all the time and and be connected on Facebook and 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 through this blog and through this podcast, I've had a chance to meet so many more that I'm just like thinking, man, why didn't I know you guys back, you know, <laughs> when I was in Annapolis, it'd have been so much more fun, you know? So I think that to answer your question, yeah, if I was talking to, to Carl Darden at age 14, I would say, look, man, do good in high school, do your best, work hard, but take some time to enjoy yourself a little bit more too, because, you know, you're only young one time. <laughs> so... It's so true. That's such good advice. It resonates with me. And it also like, it just points to that relationship of like, no matter how driven and disciplined and goal oriented. And I feel like so many of the people that, and you know, kids that you come across are that way relationships in the end are what matter. Mm -hmm. And you know, those, the friendships that we build and the, the networks that we build are that are grounded in, you know, who we are is right is it as we get older we realize like man that's really where where the good stuff is so yeah. 
I, your advice is solid and I will, I'm excited mm -hmm. to have that out there. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Um, um, so as far as where people can connect with you, um, to, to follow you and get more of this great advice and storytelling, um, where can we find you? Okay. So, uh, I am on Instagram. You can find me at Carl D Navy 84. And I also have a different account. It's, it's just the Navy sports nation account. That's where I post a lot of the, uh, the Navy sports related stuff. Okay. And then on Twitter, it's at, at Navy sports nation. And then, uh, of course, they can follow uh, Navy Sports Central wherever they get their podcasts. Um, and I always try to come up with some some you know, different Navy stories, whether they're current or in the past. And I do want to share one quick thing with you before before oh, we wrap things up. And it's actually mm -hmm. off of uh, off of one of the uh, the questions on your list here. And it was uh, my favorite Naval Academy sports story. Okay, oh, yes, for <laughs> this, sure. This is one that I never get tired of telling, but uh about well when, we, when i was going when i was going to the academy uh and we we're playing you know the the football program they always played notre dame every single year right and <clears throat> i'm there's a that's a whole nother story how that that ended up happening that i'm not going to go into but uh the fact is we'd lost to them year after year after year after year and there are a couple times where we came really really close one time a referee completely botched a call Another time, if we would, uh, we caught a long pass and if the field would have been three yards shorter or three yards wider, we would have scored the touchdown <laughs> and yeah. uh, we would have won the game. That didn't happen. <clears throat> so basically, you know, flash to 2007. Now the losing streak is 42, right? Um, and it's just, this is getting crazy. But this is the one year because Notre Dame was having a little bit of a down year and Navy had uh, a solid offensive team. Their defense was a little bit suspect, but we figured, okay, this might be the chance, right? Yeah. And they managed to beat them in in triple overtime, 46 to 44. And I will tell you what, I went absolutely berserk. <laughs> <laughs> sure. This was before the days of Facebook and stuff, but I was getting ready. I, I was, um, I had just finished, I think my second Marine Corps marathon, right? And I was on this running page with a bunch of my friends. So I jumped onto that page and I just put in the biggest bold face type I could find. I said, after 46, after 42 years of frustration, Navy 46, Notre Dame 44, now I can die in peace. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a sports fan, your story just gave me the chills all over. So I get it. 42 years is an insane amount of time. Right, right. So, so yeah. And, and those uh, are the stories people don't know. And they're the it's the and it's the anecdote that like all things are possible, right? Exactly. Like you know that streaks get broken, bad times end. Mm -hmm. things, you know, you can extrapolate so much from these sports stories, but yeah, the, and the release, like <laughs> even just as I'm not even on that field and you're like, oh, I feel it. So, that's <laughs> yeah. so cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So. You know, you're going to, you're going to make me go look up the the clip of, of that. that <laughs> I'll, have, I'll watch the end of that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a crazy game, but uh, yeah, you, you can pull it up on YouTube. You'll find it someplace. And when you see the reaction, because we beat them in South Bend. And oh even, my god even that's on then, my bucket list is a Notre, a Notre Dame football game is on my bucket list because right. it just looks like such an amazing you know experience right, right. so but yeah oh my gosh that was that's incredible <laughs> it was just nuts so. yeah I can see why that's your favorite story <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I've enjoyed this conversation so much and I feel like we have so many intersections, you know, where we're we're hitting on things that we have in common. And I I think it's so cool how you've taken your your passion and your interest in things and turned it into kind of a just a storytelling and mentorship space. So I'm really happy we connected and we'll make sure that all the everything gets in the show notes so people know where to find you. And I just thank you for your time today. This has been awesome. All right. Thank you, Wendy. I really appreciate the time to chat with you. And I learned about your what you're doing as well. And uh, like I said, I listened to a couple episodes already, but uh, I've already clicked the follow button on your podcast. So uh, well, looking forward to hearing more episodes. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll be in touch for sure. I appreciate all right. your time. You have a all good right. one. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for listening to What I Meant to Say. If you enjoyed this conversation, you know what to do. Subscribe, rate, review. And for more great content, courses, and lifestyle, go to BeBetterMedia.tv.